All right, uh, we finally reached the U.S. military camp with the tr the track of fuel. And now it's time for our protagonist, whose name constantly escapes me because he's just so memorable. I don't think he's given a name. He's just the pilot. Really? I thought he was given a name. If not, well then, for uh, dang. On this, again, it takes a bit of a while. There is sometimes a gap between parts, so pardon me if they actually said his is name. It his I name? Is it his name? Something fucking other? I don't know. Okay, okay, no. okay. If he just never named yeah, the... music time because of because of apocalypse now. Oh my god, this is going for an ACU. Well, apocalypse now is nineteen the seventies, but yeah. And yes, our party has been split. We, st we stick with Connor, but we actually run the bull with the others on the bridge. Oh the my god! The 3D the bridge. Right? Oh yes. my god! Sweet. Somebody, you were right. We dude. Somebody really yeah. did like watching Apocalypse Now. Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, this guitar theme is a uh, symbol that we don't have enough money for, cl for Credence Clearwater Revival, so uh, we had to use this track instead. Well, the one a bit earlier was called the electric guitar. Or basic, or basically any of those, um, any of those Motorhead songs. Oh, so you listen to or, Queens. Or, or, or ACDC songs, where, um... So, yeah. Uh, I've, I've, only ever, I've only ever heard that one song from them, Joe. So, yeah, the entire climax of the movie is about actually, you know, getting, starting from the base of the bridge, uh, rushing you know, up, up, up and up from one of his pylons, getting properly onto it, and painstakingly gaining ground from the North Korea. I love how the... Fortunate son. Yeah. son. Ah. Anyway, I love yeah. how the music goes from, you know, your typical 70s or 80s uh, army Only rock. For reality to set in. And now we're going with the generic choir singing in the background. Bonus points if it's in Latin. No, it's very generic. <sighs> okay, I mean, credit where it's due, the music is trying more than it was prior, but, um... That's all I can really say is that it's trying. Mm -hmm. Anyway, in regards to our nameless protagonist, assuming he is nameless, this is a classic thing. It's a classic thing that game developers do so that, you know, oh, you see, the player is truly you. And... Yeah, we need to talk about it. Again, we just like we mentioned Fuse Park with Halo, inadvertently was to blip put up the trend of the two weapon system. Half Life to put the trend on of the silent protagonist that, you know, um, that has everything happening around them. Which is ironic but, because Gordon Freeman, at least, you know, became more of a character as opposed to just a nameless guy a who you can project war. on. That's because Valve knew how to, you know, the people who worked for Valve at that, at that point actually knew how to fucking write a story. Um, <coughs> Because, you know, despite, uh, you know, Gordon Freeman never saying a single word, the entirety of the environment and the NPCs around you um, always told you what was going on. Sometimes to a fault, you know, you could argue that some of the NPCs were too chatty in terms of exposition, but I don't, I don't think it's fine, you know. And it creates this atmosphere of sci-fi and mysticism that works for the idea of Outlines. Same goes for Portal, technically, because it's considered a speed off about five at this point. No real secrets asked about it. Uh, where GLaDOS is doing most of the talking, uh, you know, outside of the other character from Portal 2 that, uh, that we know about. Um, so, Seth Shell doesn't say a single word. You know, it is, again, the environment, there's stoicism of jumping on to the, you know, using the, the portal puzzle yes, and fighting against GLaDOS, so, you know, everything that is to be conveyed. Sure, you can argue old school shooters like uh, Doom did premiere the, the whole time protagonist just because we did not have room for voice acting or you know writing dialogue to begin with but uh, but it was more of a case where games did not particularly uh, were concerned in having a plot. John Carmack himself back then did mention in regards to Doom that for him a plot in a video game like that was having the plot of a poor movie and uh, I could see where this was going, but if this, but discovering recently thanks to Mandalor Gaming's review of the, the the marathon series, at the same, right at the same time that the Doom series was made, 
Bungie knew how to make the exact same type of game and making a story that was a literal mind function, you know. So, again, it really depends on what the writer wants to do and their quality of the, of the work. Um, so yeah, but again, uh, again, Outline is really responsible for creating again this modern setting of the FPS uh, protagonist where he doesn't talk and everything happens around them. Which in itself again is not a problem, but it paved the way to a lot of these games where your protagonist doesn't have a personality to speak of, but because the plot might not be written with that, with that kind of you know quality control over it, it sadly creates the effect of that you kind of wish your for your characters. The character could speak up uh, you know, and do stuff. It's the lazy thing. Devs think, oh, you know, this is genius because it makes the player feel like they're actually there. Like, don't get me wrong, there's some novelty in that idea, but the novelty of self insert characters. Okay, it really depends because, you know, maybe back, way back, people would have been satisfied with just, oh, you're here and there, but nowadays people want more interactivity here and there. And there's really only so much you can have for, you know, being an insert player. Mind you, stuff like Xenoblade Chronicles went above and beyond, providing multiple different voice actors and stuff to literally put yourself in the game to the point where you can even pick your own catchphrases, so yeah. But, however, the amount of games that go to that level of length with, you know, customization in avatars is, well, far and few between. This is not to say that it can't work, but there's a reason that people aren't really as easily satisfied with this option. And I'd argue, in the meantime, sorry, go on. I'd argue it was even a thing back then that people were starting to, you know, have higher standards for the self-inserts. This isn't to say that we never could have silent protagonists over again, like, hey, look at Bioshock. That one worked with a silent and protagonist again, pretty good. I need to stress out the Doom 2016 and his successor, Doom Eternal. Yes. Again, the doom, the Dooms there doesn't say a single word, and but to be fair, it does compensate by performing gestures. It's not just a blank slave that does it. You can tell what you can always tell what he's thinking, not just by the actions that he performs for you in gameplay, but through the actual cutscenes that happens in game, where normally you just stand there and do nothing, but he does stuff. So you do know what is on you know, his mind, um, and again, it's conveyed pretty brilliantly on that front. Also, I found in the meantime the many more protagonists. I generally forgot about this Robert Jacobs. If I recall correctly, it was actually being dropped a couple of times, so it's my bad for forgetting it. Also, you you have to have noticed that uh, because it's the final level, the North Korean troops are sporting this blue uniform, meaning that they're like the super, you know, the super <coughs> ones that resist more bullets and deal more damage about that. This is also where the game becomes more cheap in terms of the shots, because the enemy starts having pinpoint accuracy that can snipe you even from behind a cover, potentially. It gets ridiculous really fast, so there's a lot of depths we are not seeing. Don't you see, to you? it's to show how realistic it is that, in real life, you have a much harder time going up against these sort of enemies. You know, this were, this were, this was meant to be based on more real life, uh, could you imagine if they went to the, um, to the ultimate extreme and had it so, like, um, you have to play through this whole game, but if you die once, that's it, the game's over, you can never play it again, because just like in war, you only get one life. You, you know, know, there actually uh, are some special perfect. modes in games that people can yeah. select to have like, like the that. One night from Batman Arkham Origins. There's uh, also I mean, a mode from there's also a mode from Last of Us uh, Part One, and I think even the original PS4 remaster from. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Can we talk about how the AI there oh, no, didn't sure even that. respond to you shooting him? No, oh, Pedro. Ah, that's okay. Um. What I was saying was, uh, yeah, like uh, in Last of Us One, you do have a mode that basically is like a one, uh, like a one life mode, like uh, like where basically an attempt to try to complete the game on the higher difficulty without dying a single time. Because if you die a single time, you just go back in the, to the beginning. So, 
of the game. So basically, it's an attempt to challenge yourself. Basically. Or, or, or what I mean is like a game where um, if you die, if you die once, that's it. It's done. You can never play the game again. The only star screen you get is one where is one over your character's grave or something like okay, that. Okay, I think you mentioned this in another. Don't give Toby Fox role. any ideas. Not to mention, it's counterproductive for actual sales of the game. Like, yeah, how yeah. can you sell that's a game product that, that, like that? That's just a bad idea. That's just well, a... well, I mean, how many, how many other crazy ideas have you seen? Sold? Well, uh, okay. okay Why is that do allow you to actually still, you know, you know, take advantage of a product <laughs> that you spend money for? Let me put it like this, Dribs. The name. Okay, while art is definitely a good motivator, the name of the game is to still make money. I assure you, you do something stupid like that in a game, and yeah, people are likely not going to buy it when they know it's that like, much of a waste. The, the closest you could think of something like you described, Lips, were the original releases of Doki Doki Literature Club and One Shot, which yes, they did have the permanent consequences, but sometimes did prevented you from playing the game properly after that. The only way you could fix it was literally to just uninstall and then reinstall the game. That's a thing, like Doki Doki Literature Club, one, it was free, and two, the yeah, developer- well, like, same, was, same as one shot to draw, but that's why I also use that as an example. That said though, two, the developer was such a good sport that he did share how to, you know, properly reload the game o overall here and there, despite Certain things that okay, happen. To be with fair, it. Trova, it's not rocket science. It's literally just uninstall and reinstall. Well, like said, given how certain stuff with Doki Doki Literature Club goes, for some people that was a bit tougher if they're not really big with computers and all that. So I can yes, get why he left in instructions. The recent Plus version uh, makes it easier by making it so that uh, you start not. With the game, but then starting the computer in a virtual yeah, computer. Yeah, fictional OS. So yes. Uh, so basically, when when the game erases itself, what it erases itself is like with it, and you can go into the the fictional computer and tell the game to reset itself, so it becomes a lot easier. You don't have to reinstall the game all over again. Again, so one shot does convenient. kind of something similar. This is mostly because we haven't seen it yet. So don't worry. I, I will plan on you know trying to record one shot away because it's gonna be a bit difficult because the entire gimmick of one shot is that um it also loves to have some puzzles that requires you to not just think outside the box but to operate outside of the box in your general this was literally about uh putting the game in a corner taking like a file that was included in the game files uh, potentially um and having to toggle it because for some reason it will be made to react with your desktop in some kind of fashion like say a grid that will light up specific numbers depending on the colors that you have in the Xbox desktop it's really it was really cool stuff but of course for these re-release that has to be pay, paid of course we had to operate with a fictional OS that kind of still combat this kind of thing to get back to, I wanted to get back to an earlier point we were doing and talking about in the last part regarding, you know, single player campaign add, adding to the multiplayer of a game. Uh, I actually do, I actually really love the way they handled in Ghost of Tsushima where they actually make the multiplayer part of the, of the single player campaign's world. Because basically the way they do it is basically throughout the entire uh, world uh, out of the system, there's this guy who tells you stories about these legendary spirits who add all yes, these... Yes, Uncle Iroh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. yeah. Because uh, he's played by the same voice actor that replaced yeah. uh, Mako. Well, oh. that, well, that guy is in practically everything that's inspired by Japanese culture, so that's just... Uh, at this, Ooh, at, Greg at, at Baldwin? This point. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, 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 the job, it's him voicing a character in something that takes expression from Japanese culture. Like, like uh, I'm, I still stick with the Japanese voice acting for Ghost of Tsushima, but I have to admit that that was a kind of a nice touch. Voice actors in the English dub are all Asian Americans, too, so they do manage to do the good accent that they, that they need. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Daisuke Tsuji who does the voice act, the English voice acting, is the model for Jin's design, and he is Japanese. So oh, guys, sure. stuff is happening, explosions, Yeah, shooting. again, it was eventually, we're, we're finally reaching the bridge, so like he said, now it's all about painstakingly, and I do mean it, I mean to gain 
centimeter by centimeter of terrain from the North Koreans. Uh, the game will literally make you feel your sweating, fighting tooth and nail on every single bit of the bridge. Okay, so, so let me yeah. ask. I, ca I kind of get what, the, what it's going for. It is still a bit of excruciating painful, but it ca I get it, uh, you know. I was about to ask, do you feel like they do it in at least a good way that helps the gameplay, or does it feel more annoying? Would you say? Well, that that ultimately depends on you. Um, like I said, I'm cutting out a lot of times where you will die a lot of here. But the good news is that since uh, now you're backed up by the rest of the army, chances are a lot of the enemies will be distracted by the okay. other fire, which will give you time to flank them potentially. But you still need to be on your guard. Okay, okay, okay. I think a better question is: Does it feel fair or does it feel cheap? It's the last level, so you. You know what the trend was with games around this time, Drova? The game is throwing everything in a kitchen sink at you. Sink at you. Now, this isn't to say that you, that a game can't do that and, you know, be fair about it. I've seen plenty of examples of it, but I won't deny it can get cheap. <coughs> and I will say this. Mm -hmm. Don't use realism as an excuse to make your games feel cheap. That's it's just a, bad, a yeah. bad road Again, to go down. We're still talking about realism in a game that's about North Korea managing to yeah. occupy the United States. Yeah, so like, think, that's always been the yeah. paradox of when people try to go, Oh, well, you see, this realism in the game is thought-provoking here. Look, by nature of a video game, you're gonna have unrealistic stuff. Like, I feel yeah. like the whole that's realism that. thing only works like, you know... Life simulators or whatnot, but okay. I can tell you, I, I can tell you that the the when it came to talking about this game, not boy, not many people did mention stuff about you know the the realism as a point of saying that it was either a point of, against the game or to be praising by. It. Sorry, for for a second there, I thought um, I thought the game was going to have a plot twist where where um, where that what the woman you're with I thought. It's gonna have a plot twist where she, because she was pointing a gun at us when we walked past her. I thought the twist was gonna be she she turned. She she no, dreams. <laughs> Thankfully, they don't do that. Again, the only time they did it was with the mole that uh, our party had in the concentration camp, and that was like a one-time thing that uh, you could see coming a long mile away. I, I, I could, I could, I could just see the uh, activation now. You see, I I come to realize that it's America that are the true terrorists or something. Sure. Like that. Again, dreams. Yeah. Team America. Team America. <laughs> said maybe it best uh, about uh, people, Americans siding with North Korea or something. Like, but yeah, no, I mean... Now, again, this isn't to assume that this game is going for that, but... Nine times out of ten, that's usually what these kind of games, especially around, like, the 2010s and whatnot, were definitely going on in games about feeling more realistic. Like, that was, unfortunately... One of the defining factors of 7th Gen Gaming, with them trying to go for more realistic graphics, more realistic stuff here and there. Now mind you, again, this isn't to say that it was always a bad thing, but it was a hindrance in a lot of avenues here and there. Browns and greys dominating entirely, even stuff like the Metal Gear games could not escape that. And would you look at that now, because of going for realistic stuff, the graphics have not exactly aged the best from the PS3 era compared to, say, stuff from PlayStation 1 or, heck, even the PS2 era. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't still some games that aged well in the PS3 era, but let's be honest, there's a reason the PS3 era is known as being pretty rough. And that's aside from the PS3 problems Whoa. itself here and there. Shit! But the more, uh -oh. Now we're literally having... Oh, now we're literally having a detour, believe it or not. The thing is... Um, the thing is about that, it depends also on how good the art director is when it comes to executing yeah. that style. Because in the case of Yoshi Shinkawa, uh, the guy is a master of his craft, which is why if you play Metal Gear Solid 2 today, yeah, it definitely, it's definitely a PS2 game, but it still looks uh, good um, I for, would, what, uh, for what it is. Okay, one, that's a PS2 game as opposed to a PS3 one, but I'll, you know what, to be fair, for the sake of argument, let's bring in Metal Gear Solid 4. You do have a good point there. Uh, here's the thing about Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear Solid is a game that feels like, yes, it was technically getting more realistic in the looks, but it's still new to toe the line because, well, let's be honest, by the time of Metal Gear Solid 2, 
we were going pretty over the top. Like, I'll say this, for as much flack as people give Twin Snakes for going over the top, I attribute Twin Snakes going over the top as it, you know, staying true to how Metal Gear Solid 2 is flipping over the top. Like, uh, there was also another reason that I found off screen draw that the cutscene director, it's a move, it's also a movie director that specialized in doing that kind of weird shit. Wow, so Twin Snakes. Was, yeah. They, uh, they had a cutscene director, a particular cutscene director. Let me see if I can find him. I will say this though, to Twin Snakes' credit, I don't think it's any more crazy than the stuff we see in Metal Gear Solid 2. Like, without spoiling here, we see a guy single-handedly take on several flipping Metal Gears yeah. in Metal Gear Solid 2. Mind you, Metal Gears, you know, those the things that are supposed to be endgame bosses. Granted, this is one of the issues people had with Metal Gear Solid 2. Again, I think it's still a good game, but it does have a lot of... Well, the thing is, well, the thing is Joe, but we also, there's actually a plot reason why Raiden is even able to do that to begin with, because it's all part of the Patriots plan anyway. Oh, true, 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 yeah, but what I mean is, like, well, in terms of going over the top, Oh boy, Metal Gear Solid 2 certainly oh, went there. Metal Gear is always bad. Oh, Metal Gear is always bad. Uh, Ryue Kitamura, he did work as a cutscene director only and only for Twin Snakes, mind you. Um, so See. even if you say that he was inspired by, you know, by by the influence of 2, he was still doing its own thing. And I can tell you for a fact, because I saw a couple of movies of this guy, it's kind of like it's, it's kind of trademark. Mm -hmm. When it comes to me comparing it to... Oh, sorry, go on, Pedro. They put it this way. It's one of those things... Okay, so here's the thing. I wouldn't even have as, that much of a problem with Snake jumping on top of a missile if the if it wasn't for the other stuff. Because the, my big problem with the way um, uh, Twin Snakes is over top is not so much the action. It's more so the way the characters behave. That's my problem. Again, like I've said in our commentary, Snake pointing a gun at President Baker the way he does is out of character. Snake doesn't behave like that. He's not a, a, a he's not a psychopath. It, like, it, it make, that's my problem with Twin Snakes. Like, uh, I could handle the hover top action if the characters acted in character, but they, like, but it's, that, that's just like, no. I can that's definitely see where you're coming behaves. from on that. In regards to me connecting it to Metal Gear Solid 2, it's also the fact that Twin Snakes was using Metal Gear Solid 2's as engine, and if I recall correctly, the teams there did trade some stuff back and forth between each other. But, uh, yeah, no, 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 I mean... Uh, kind of, but you have to also remember that, like I've, like Teo said, we have to remember that the cutscenes in Twin Snakes had a different director than Metal Gear Solid 2. But it's, but it's kind of infamous for that. Uh, but yeah. that particular Which, stuff, again, but... We also do one over. Oh, God. See, my, my, it's, it's more so the fact that Twin Snakes um, doesn't really feel like. Again, it, it's trying to do something different, as Kojima himself said. My problem is that, again, it's it doesn't feel like uh, a, a Metal Gear game because it doesn't have that Kojima style of direction where there's a lot of over the top stuff, but at the same time, the characters still feel like they. Uh, like you, you can still get invested in the characters because of their common sense, but in Twin Snakes, they literally take Snake's common sense away, and that's just something that I cannot forget. Also, the low poly models of the wolves are still terrible. I mean, they Again, were... well, well, my biggest issue was most of the acting. Yeah, and the voice, the voice acting being the way it is, all over the place. That doesn't help either. Yeah. Alright, so you... Oh, sorry. Oh, wait, hold on. Yes, Tio? No, 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 no. It was just to mention, you know, just also to mention feedback from Fred, because again, we're almost at the end of the game as well. Um, but we had kind of a detour where we were, where protagonist was just to crawl up the bridge and he managed to get back up. It was kind of comical because it was literal filler that, you know, um, took us away a bit of time. But just to mention, that particular section is also the hardest in the entire game, particularly in difficulties because you're alone in a cramped space and you're fighting an helicopter and a couple of troops that follow you through that direction. And like I said, pinpoint accuracy. Um, Meaning that you can get sniped even behind a cover, it gets stupid real fast. And now, for in fact, actually, this is kind of the last stretch where you're basically supposed to wait until Hopper hijacks, actually, even for the North Korea, but can be used again. Then. Continue, Pedro. 
it's hell, it's not even just the voice acting to it. Like uh, the other, uh, even the sound mixing has its issues because, uh, like, if you go back, like I said, the original PS1 version had reverberation. Basically, I mean, depending on where the characters were, you would hear echo and reverberation in their voices. You know, like if they were in, like in a wide space. You know, you, um, compared to how if they were in a tight space. You know. But uh, but if you actually take a look at the um, at the the Twin Snakes voice clips, they sound like they came from a recording studio, which of course they did. Thing is, uh, usually in usually in video game voice acting, post in the, in the post production process, usually you apply some filters to have the voice. Like whenever a character is say in, a, in the catacombs, you know, you add a filter to make it look like the voice is echoing, right? Otherwise, it kind of sounds off. Twin Snake doesn't do that. Again, the P if the PS1 version did that, why couldn't the more advanced GameCube version do it? It's so see, weird. See, the weird thing that I keep coming back to in Twin Snakes is like, well, for all our issues with it, Kojima apparently took a look at the game as is and oh, sure. gave it his blessing, so like... Oh, sure. Sure. That doesn't mean I have to approve of it. Oh, no, 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 no. I absolutely get that. I'm just trying to solve the mystery here in this regard, like... And again... It's about the I, I can solve the mystery right for you. Kojima, being human, uh, and for as talented as he is, makes mistakes, and that was a mistake, in my opinion. So of course, if you like Twin Snakes, that, that's good for you. I really do feel like Twin Snakes was definitely about of exactly the time that game was made and whatnot here and there. Especially because these days, uh, especially because these days, at least we're time kind of recording, Konami is preparing to release the DPS one version rather than that. Um, Which again, but then we recorded the, the first time in GN, so there was a the fact that they had pulled from GOG, the, those PC versions, because we needed to uh, work around. Um, there's some of the copyright, but they restated, and yeah, we're that. Anyway, now you get this this actual real pilot um, UAC, I think, it's a strike drone, where you basically bomb the shit out of everything. Like, it's essentially a moment where the game tells you, okay, it's okay, you, you had your share of pain, so here's basically this remote control, have fun. I swear though, is this gonna be one of those cases where, okay, this is the ending and then we get an abrupt cut to black, then get maybe some text and then we hit credits? Credit, so we still like, kind of have an ending, but like I said, you can kind of tell that uh, they were still wanting to franchise this, but uh, on, in a couple of minutes, we still need, uh, we also have a bit of a gameplay after this. You know, if I may, mm -hmm. I feel like this is kind of a thing I've noticed in our commentating gig with a lot of games like these, you know, they feel almost like some tie-in games where they have an abrupt end, and then suddenly that's it, which is weird compared to, say, something like, Crash Bandicoot. Oh, mind you, Crash Bandicoot does not exactly have a full fleshed out story, but it feels like it has a beginning and proper end of sorts, whereas these bigger budget oh, yeah. things for some reason feel so lax in how they end to the point where you have to wonder, were they really planning to make a franchise out of this or just a quick buck? Because this was made by people who clearly didn't have much talent and didn't exactly know how to produce a, a hit on also, the level of Halo and Gears. Also, yeah. yes, tanks can actually move that fast, go figure. Oh, well, it is more of a cheap than your pilot can as for Crash, well, Crash is meant to be a set more of a Saturn morning 90s cartoon anyway, so... Oh, also, my point is like, boss, well... Uh, your, your final boss is a Goliath, uh, our profit. Uh. Cute. Um, but yeah, but, like, my point about Crash is like, well, even with the more minimalistic storytelling, it feels at least like a proper good end as opposed to a lot of these uh, FPS games where it's just, oh, you got to the end. Boom. Like, mm -hmm. you don't even get a bombastic congratulations, it's just... Oh, it's over. That being said, that being said I can pick two... I can actually pick uh, some games from the PS3 era that actually do uh, succeed at making... Again, the Uncharted uh, PS3 trilogy, I will argue those games still look good. Um, those, again, because the art director of those games was smart, and... Proper applied full use of color and the character designs were very, um, very old school to the point where they had a timeless appeal to the, the character design of the characters in a lot of ways. All right, ending time. Go on. Boy, they can't wait for this. 
This is Connor Morgan. Enemy armor column rolling in from the south. Oh. Request immediate airstrike at the mouth of the Negative on the airstrike. Friendly units are danger close. You need to hit them now. Negative. We don't have a solid ID on hostile targets. Oh, fuck it. Warpath! Fire on my position! What are you doing? Look for the yep, call are sacrificing himself for these. Uh, Oh, and let me guess, this is such a majestic sacrifice! Again, Connor has proven for the entire game that he's kind of an asshole, but this is supposed to be, look how noble he is to defeat the enemy. So, it, mm, I Sad. get the feeling too that, I get the feeling too they're trying to do something akin to Dom sacrificing Gears 3. Kinda, a bit. Uh, Alright, if I call Craig, we're having one last narration from the radio host. This is Europa News in London. Actually, no. The Underground Voice of Freedom Network reports that American resistance fighters have joined U.S. military forces in a major offensive in occupied San Francisco at the Golden Gate Bridge. The coordinated attack may prove to be a turning point in America's guerrilla war against the Korean occupation. Meanwhile, the EU Defense Council has called an emergency session to plan support for our allies across the Atlantic. So... Sounds like, sounds like, sounds like someone from the 40s. And... That... That's it, isn't it? Cut to credits, yes. There we go, we've got this down to a science. Okay. I mean... Again, you can tell that the, Oh my god, the that's literally the ending yeah, scene as talk footage. And it's not even moving credits, it's just this passing thing, like, if the <sighs> Hell Deep was Russian cheap. Again, the idea behind it is that uh, Connor sacrifices himself, ideally. You don't know what happened to the protagonist, uh, to begin with, or the other characters. Uh, um, and you just know that the war will continue, and potentially will escalate with help from the new... From Europe, though, Doesn't you know. feel like um, we accomplished okay, much then in that regard. Nope. Well, it's like at the end of the Tangled game, like we're out of money and time, so... It felt like a conclusion still. Again, 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 you know, it, yeah, I mean, honestly, even the Tangled game felt like it had more of a conclusion. Yeah, like, that's the weird, true. you know, here's the weird thing about this game. Your goes to join his writing again, yes, a fountain of a great ideas that helped shape over in a way we couldn't have without it. <laughs> How cool. wonderful. Like, you uh, know... Supposedly. See, here's the thing about games like this. For as big budget as they may appear, there's just something about an abrupt ending that that can make a whole project feel... cheap. I mean, and, and you know, I know. I'm not judging it strictly by just that ending, or even these cheap credits, but man... I feel like it's the game as a whole, but when you top it off with an abrupt ending, it really gives the feeling that they did this on the absolute cut, and they did not mask it well, which definitely suggests more cheapness. Alright, uh, no post credit scene, so final thoughts, please. Um, it was definitely- it's a game. It was definitely a video game about how the big brave Americans are uh, fighting against the evil Korean people. I, I, I gotta say, uh, I, I gotta say, this, um, this uh, 1982 video game was uh, very ahead of its time. Wait, what do you mean it came out in 2011? <laughs> also, they had support from Vigil Games, the studio that normally does the Darksiders games. Uh, yeah, this, this, to, to me, this just comes off as one of those... Um, there's one of those really jingoistic uh, games where basically it's like, a, yeah, big, big, strong America facing the evil foreigners. Okay, again, I, it was kind of a tradition also from Call of Duty and Battlefield. The uh, average Call of Duty plot, to be it or not, for a while was just standard Russian invasion of America. Even by even by 2011, this was this was this is extremely. This is extremely stale. I mean, hell, there was a reason why even before the fall of the Soviet Union, not every single James Bond film was about him and the Soviets. Because, hey. you know, that, 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 that got stale in terms of storytelling. Well, you know, Tintin only had his first comic against the Soviet and it was never adapted. I mean, I guess by the time... What, what, the, when did the cartoon come out? The 90s, though. Hmm. And if I, if I recall correctly, it's more because the the, the DJ Soviet contains uh, some of the outdated stuff yeah. that they oh. probably wanted to avoid. Yeah, but, but the, 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 the cartoon came out two months before the Soviet Union fell, so 
this still just tells you what you can go there. Um, so yeah, the, the the story just comes up as every single generic American great foreigner bad story. I um, got to see Dwimps. It turns out even the Americans are bad and bloodthirsty at some point. But, because I'm um, not worshipping Uncle Sam oh, 24 no, 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 oh, no, 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 Remember, the ones that are like, cannibalistic or butchering Koreans that they capture. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's not even, it's not even just that. It's just, it's just, but other than that, it's just a generic first person shooter. You went around and shoot a lot of stuff, like. But what about like Connor Dwibs? Don't you care for him? God bless his soul for all the swearing, cursing, shooting, killing, massacring he did. Um, that's the thing. The only thing I know is that his middle name is apparently fucking. <laughs> like, like, I mean, car I mean, that's like the only conversation. Well, the few conversations I remember from this game. <laughs> or if it is a Connor, fucking whatever. Um, uh, the music is just there. Like, I, 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 I don't know, I, I swear I've heard that kind of music in almost every single one of these kinds of games. Um, and the graphics, it definitely looks like a PS3 game in 2011. A bit more polished than the ones that came out during the first half of that generation's life cycle. But it still doesn't really hold up all that much. Um, anything else? The voice acting? Uh, oh, yeah, the voice acting. It was. Um. Nothing good. Yeah, I mean, considering the script, I mean, how else are they going to act it? I can tell you that I like a Connor's voice actor in Pizza the Role. Yeah, well, that's the thing, though. His role is to be, um. Asshole. Yeah. So that was Homefront. Um,. Again, it's it's a video game. And well, the one, one quick thing before I go: Why does behind the voice actors think the game came out in two thousand and eight? I don't know. Maybe it started development around that time. They thought look so dated that they thought these guys. Sure. <laughs> right. but, but yeah, that's it. Java. Why? That was yeah. certainly an FPS. It it had characters in it. They uh, they did they shoot, stuff. They shot things. <laughs> they shot things. They swore up a storm. They showed us that war is hell. And I'm guessing this game really wants us to like Connor. Like here's the thing. Like at least other games, for as annoying as they can be, I can definitely get when they want me to care about a person. But with Connor, it feels like half and half. They want you to hate him. Half and half, they want you to love him. And I don't mean that in a clever way where he's a complicated character. I mean in a sense where it feels like half of the script is like this and the other half of the script is like that in a very non-coherent format. Again, mm -hmm. like I said, this game simultaneously feels like it's going over the top, but playing things so painfully by the numbers going off of this campaign... It sounds like the best gameplay is to be found in the multiplayer, and well, again, servers are out, so yeah. The single player is mainly what's left to judge by, and I'm sorry, it's not up to snuff. Like, eh, the graphics are a bit of an eyesore to look at, but they're probably the least of this game's problems. I mean, now the controls seem to be relatively fine. However, the missions, for the most part, are pretty bog-standard. And like Tio said, it's like a theme park. You go here, do this or that. Go here, do this or that. Go here. Settle down for a bit, then lather and repeat. Again, a lot of games, even great games, have done this before, but they mask it a lot better. This one really just seemed like it was made for a quick buck, and man, poor Jason Rubin. Going from Crash Bandicoot to this. <laughs> to be fair, he kind of inherited that hot potato and did not know how much to work with it. Oh yeah, I mean, that's why I feel more sorry for him than I do feel disappointed. Like, um, if he got this at like a time when THQ was practically already going under, 
I can totally get how nothing he could have done could have saved this short of them really overhauling, you know, production of this game. Like, I really do have to shake my head and wonder, were they really expecting a game this wackily put together to be the thing that would save THQ? Because, look... I'm just gonna say this more, I, I think I've only seen the case where it's like a truly amazing game that saves a company from dying. Like, I've never seen like, you know, a lackluster game be the one that saves a company from dying. Like, I'm pretty sure Square would have been dead if Final Fantasy VII was on the same level of quality as this game. Hmm. Again, it, it, it's very so-and-so. I, I can't even really recommend this if you're into FPS shooters that much. There are countless games. You can probably get at better prices for this game, even if it is used. And yeah, this being full price at the time... Yeah, the usual 60 bucks for this. Look, even if the multiplayer was great... I'm sorry, this single-player campaign does not help bring it up to being full price-worthy. Alas. Alas. Mm-hmm. Next! Pedro. Um... Yeah, there's all... There's only so much, I, uh, so much I can say about these shooters that we've been playing through. They kind of blend in together. Like, the script lacks in any and all. Again, it's like, like Teo said. These are games that are t clearly trying to capture the audience, uh, like the market of Halo and Gears of, and especially Gears of War. The problem is that they don't seem to understand what made those games work uh, versus well, this one. Like, it again, it's... Uh, the, the writing is garbage. The... The the overall art direction, like Joe has been saying, is was not handled cleverly, um, mm -hmm. like like Gears or or like I was saying, Uncharted was the um, like the 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 the, 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 the gameplay itself looks functional, I guess, but that's I mean, if I when it comes to playing, it doesn't seem like the gameplay of this game is anything to offer that I can already get from Halo. So, I don't know. The music is... I mean, like Jova said, towards the end of the game, it seems to start picking up, but by that point, it's a bit too little too late for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, one more to add to the pile, I guess. Hopefully the kill zone and resistance games are better. Well, that's what I want to discover. Again, I'm planning on recording those eventually. Well, I can tell you already, Resistance is better than this, so this trilogy, even if I have my problems with it. So, um, if that concludes your final thoughts, Pedro... Uh, I guess it too. too. Yeah, 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 don't worry. Um, I wanted to kind of like this game because it does have some interesting ideas, and uh, it wants to showcase this gritty scenario where America is oppressed by this ruthless invader and it gives a taste of the countless tragedies that other countries had, you know, both Asia and Europe had to suffer, but America never quite properly on their own. Um, but it's done in a, such a sloppy way that uh, it doesn't have a bite onto it. It's close to actually doing something, but it's still not enough. Um, and before you know it, it's over, you know, you kind of trying to set, set things up with stuff like Connor being, you know, ruthless, uh, but you think it might have a point because in a situation like this, you need to be ruthless, uh, potentially, in order to succeed. Um, you get the conflict of uh, Hooper, you know, because he's also uh, of partial uh, Central Eastern Asian ethnicity. So um, he might be conflicted and feeling inadequate because he might be judged by others. Um, but those things are only talked about superficially. Even the, um, like Joe was saying, the evil Americas, Americas renounced the way of patriotism. Um, well, it's not even just that they renounce patriotism. Like, no, no, no. They still seem to be... Just be to be evil, yeah, I know. Again, just play something like Lisa. He does that kind of thing much better, right? 
and yeah, in, in, in to, to, at the center of everything is our protagonist, Robert Jacobs, who has no personality to speak of, not a voice to, to voice his Oh, so he did have a name after all, that's right. I did mention it. Um, not a you know not a passing thought we only see briefly what he does through non-proper gameplay section it's not meant to convey what he's thinking about he's just a mindless robot that obeys the rules of the resistance and moves forward winning the day without saying anything it's not i cannot get the same vibe again by playing doom i don't feel like robert jacobs is a stoic just you know, guy that helps these people in need through the sheer amount of determination. I what I get is just this mindless robot that doesn't tell anything and just has a gun. He doesn't feel immersed because again I'm one of those people who do not fall for the this character is relatable kind of meme. Mm. Um his protagonist. Sure, I might get relatable if you have some characters in video games to be relatable, but that's never really too much of a focus for me. Um, it's not even just about it being relatable, it's the fact that he is literally the blankest slate, just yeah. so that the protagonist can project themselves onto him. Like, it's something you see out of a lazy visual novel. Again, it, from the little bit I've seen, the Call of Duty games managers managed to have better plots. Uh, maybe if Activision manages not be assholes with their copyright, we might check some of them in the future because I'm generally curious about what they effectively pull off. Uh, and Joss Kocher talked and praised actually their plots for years on his channel. So in, there has to be some minimal thing they do right. Mm -hmm. at least. Um, but that's a story for another time. As for this game, again, the music, like Pedro mentioned and the other mentioned, it tries to wake up towards the end, the finish line, but it's too little too late. The graphics are fine for me. Sure, too much the usual, too much grays and browns. But uh, you can kind of tell this was done towards the end cycle of the PS3 because it also has the thing about uh, not too much texture popping and no slowdowns, which is cool actually, especially considering the autosave. So it's nothing to scoff that much about, um, turn me on my part. The gameplay is just your typical FPS. Unfortunately, the weapons that you at disposal are as boring as it gets, only briefly you get to do something interesting like controlling drones. But it's very, very short time and you wish you had more. Um, it Again, some other cool ideas like incorporating a, a Goliath drone as the final boss after you get sort of accustomed to the ones that you had in your custody for a long time. That's a cool concept. Um, but again, it's over before you know it and that ending is just laughable. That's not even to mention the bad um, initial live action FMVs that talk about how the world has led us to this point, which are were cute, are kind of cute in hindsight, considering again this was done in 2010, 2011, um, before all the shit that happened in the, from the mid 2010s, and we're still living to this very day. So hilarious, I guess. But as for the AP. Like he said, this game is over, but as for the AP, um, the TLTHQ uh, got bankrupted, and all from the fact properly from the get-go was one of the things that Deep Silver purchased. So a couple of years later, instead of actually doing a sequel to this, they rebooted the AP entirely. They did exactly <laughs> what EA did with Nero's Edge. They wow. We decided, decided, sure, let's... You know, Blank Slate is at the same setting, the same setting, North Korea invading the US, just in a more tweaked kind of way, and let's have people control it, uh, you know, member of resistance. Is it it's, sad that I never even heard is, of that reboot? It's called Home from the Revolution, and from what I've been told, it's bad as well. So, it, it, that the good <laughs> thing about this, Jovan, it's that because of that, and the huge quantity of the uh, physical copies that God released them. It's cheap as fuck. I oh boy. I can get bucks if I want. So, stay tuned for the future for that So, one. Tio, let me guess. Because of how bad it was, no sequel. Yeah, basically. So Ouch. anyway, yeah. See you eventually, see you eventually for uh, On Front of the Revolution. We'll see how that turns out. Yeah. See ya. Yeah.